to. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Hey everybody, hope you're having a great weekend and welcome to the Yaron Brook Show on this uh, beautiful Saturday. So um, I, I've kind of had a rough week. Uh, some of you watching the video might uh, notice. I, you know, those of you listening might see a little bit of uh, lower level of energy. Uh, I had surgery on Tuesday, scheduled surgery, so it wasn't a surprise. But um, had back surgery, so I had uh, had a uh, ma massive bulging disc. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about uh, backs, between L3 and L4. Uh, L3 and L4, the vertebrates at the at the lower lower part of the back. Um, so I did that surgery on Wednesday. I am a little low energy uh, today. Still kind of recovering. I've got my brace on. I'm trying to stand, which the doctor recommends standing as much as possible, and and walking around, which is kind of surprising because you know you kind of just had surgery. You'd expect the doctor to say just lie down, don't move life flat uh but but that's not the deal anymore today uh you know doctors encourage you to move and to to be engaged and to get the muscles going although i am uh, i am wearing uh wearing the brace uh you know i don't know how much you want to get into my 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 personal history but there is there are, there are some interesting aspects of this um this is my third back surgery uh in the last uh 38 years uh, 40 years uh, and, um, you know, the changes are pretty dramatic. Uh, the first back surgery I ever had was when I was in the Israeli army. Uh, many of you know, I, I served in the Israeli army between the ages of 18 to 21. Uh, in, uh, uh, first I was in the tank corps and, uh, later on <clears throat> in military intelligence. And really the reason I shifted from, um, uh, from the tank corps to military intelligence was really because my I had back surgery uh, kind of nine months into my service. Actually, while I was attending tank commander school, I, I, was, uh, I was destined to be a tank commander. You know, who knows what, what, I would, have, what I would have happened, um, uh, what would have happened after that. But um, yeah, so, I, you know, my, my, I had two massively ruptured discs in uh while i was in the military i i kind of went home on vacation just before tank commander school and the doctors all said you know you have to lie down for a month and you have to not move or, and possibly surgery and i said to hell with you i need to go to tank commander school there's no way i'm skipping that and i went right back and within like two days i realized what a massive mistake i had made i i was in unbelievable pain I don't think I've ever been in such pain in my life and and I was losing feeling in my leg and of course the military doctors had no clue and I, ultimately it took about a week I got back home and landed up in the hospital and and landed up under the surgeon knife and in those days when they did back surgery they would literally rip you open I mean they would cut you so I've got this long scar down the back um I had two ruptured discs. There were no MRIs. There were no CAT scans. So to a large extent, the doctor had to rip you open and go and look to figure out what was going on there. Um, and uh, two ruptured discs, L4, L5, L5S1, so the two lowest discs in the back in the lumbar area. So they had, you know, they had to cut through bone, and it, you know, and it took months to recover. It was, it was major, major uh, surgery. I, I was in the hospital. I could barely walk afterwards. And they, they didn't encourage you in those days. They didn't encourage you to walk. They wanted you flat on your back. They wanted you lying down uh, for a few days. And um, and then you started walking. And, and when I remember when I first started walking, I couldn't feel my legs. Both my both my legs were numb. So you kind of the legs bounced because uh, you couldn't feel that you were touching the ground. But the leg knew it was touching the ground, so it bounced up, and you kind of didn't have complete control, um, you know, complete control after this. Uh, so, uh, yes, two ruptured discs, no feeling down my left leg, 
pretty brutal, massive surgery and, and all of that. Not just bulging discs, sorry, ruptured discs. They were ruptured. Uh, so since I, that was when I was 19, and because of that, I landed up in military intelligence, which, which is probably a good thing. I think I enjoyed my time in military intelligence more than I would have in the tank corps. Um, but, uh, and who knows, if I stayed in the tank corps, who knows, I, I would have been, uh, you know, in Lebanon in 1982, and, and who knows what would have, how that would have gone. Um, but since then, on and off over the years, had lots of back problems, lots of back trouble, um, uh, had doctors tell me I needed surgery, uh, pain would go away, uh, sometimes it would come back, kind of on and off, uh, back problems, what now, for 38 years, about six, seven years ago, it got really bad, really nasty, um, tried everything and, and you know, couldn't really take it. Uh, the pain was just too much. Uh, those of you who watched some of my older videos, I know those of you who knew me could tell that when I was doing talks and debates, you could see how I, that I was in real pain. And um, also, just MRIs, you, you could get MRIs and CAT scans and everything, and you could see that there was just nothing there. There was no, there was no disc. There, it was bone on bone in the back. I mean, L4, L5 was completely gone. I think I had eight second opinions. I think I went to see eight different neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons to see what they suggested in terms of uh, best treatment for, for my back. And uh, the conclusion everybody came to was I needed to fuse L4, L5. So when they fuse it, they actually put in a whole infrastructure of titanium screws and rods and stuff. And then they take, I hope this is interesting for you guys, but I think it's pretty cool. They take, um, they take some bone marrow and they stick it in between the, the, the vertebra that are separated by these rods and these screws and everything. And they encourage it to basically grow bone. So what you get is you get the disc separated by this infrastructure. And then in between the two uh, discs, the two uh, vertebrae, you get bone growth. So basically you convert two vertebrae into one bigger vertebrae. It reduces your, your, your ability to move a little bit, your ability to bend and so on. It creates all kinds of instability elsewhere in the back. But it takes away the pain, which... Um, you know, so I did that and uh, was uh, did pretty well for six years, uh, given that. Now, what was amazing was that this entire surgery with screws and infrastructure and, and, and you know, the fusion and getting in was basically two holes. One hole in the back, one hole in my side, two little holes. It was all done arthroscopically. Um, no major cutting you open, no ripping muscles, no ripping massive quantities of tissues, but really, really, you know, uh, amazing technology of just going in there delicately and, and putting in screws and putting in infrastructure, but without ripping it all open and, and, and doing all the stuff. And it, it, the technology is truly amazing. This arthroscopic way of doing surgery, the, the new robotics that they have, that allows you to do some of this. Um, wow, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. So I have that fused six years ago, and then about two years ago, started having pain again. And over the last two years, I've done all kinds of therapy and all kinds of stuff, and nothing's worked. And basically, the disc above where um, I got fused is now ruptured. And I had Wednesday, I, they they went in and they they try to fix the rupture. They try to take out the stuff that was sticking out and pressing on the nerve. And then they injected into the space left behind from the disc. They injected um, some stem cells with the idea that the stem cells would either grow into disc or into scar tissue or whatever, but help separate the two vertebrae. My doctors, uh, what, how should I put it? This treatment was my preference, not theirs. They wanted to do another, another uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fusion. Uh, they still think I think this won't work and that we'll have to have fusion surgery in a matter of months, if not years. Um, but we did it. Uh, I think the, the initial response from the doctor was that he basically couldn't save any disc. It was so badly ruptured that the disc basically fell apart when he went in there and there was no disc to save. And he's hoping 
that the stem cells and the scar tissue and the rest will keep the separation of the... Anyway, the bottom line is it kind of sucks uh, because I, 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 don't think, I don't think I'm done with this. I think that this is like the rest of my life. This is ongoing, um, you know, back problems, surgery, problems, surgery, problems. And, you know, if you see me when I'm 90, I'm going to have basically a rod up my back. You know, so I'll be very straight. I'll be good looking because I'll be very, very straight. Won't be able to bend, twist, anything like that. So um, long-term prognosis, not good. But what the hell? Uh, we're gonna enjoy. We're gonna enjoy whatever movement I have uh, for as long as I have it. And uh, uh, you know, when I get when I get better, I think in two three months, I'm gonna start a a routine of yoga uh, and maybe Pilates and maybe some other stuff. You know, it's not like I'm not in good shape and don't have uh, strong muscles. But anyway, we're gonna do yoga, Pilates, uh, and all this other stuff in my new undisclosed location, which I will tell you about in January. Um, all right, that was not relevant to anything except bringing you up to speed to where I am and maybe explaining a little bit why I might be a little low on energy today and, and not quite up to the usual uh, yelling and, uh, and uh, getting all emotional uh, w with you guys. Um, you know, thanks, thanks for being patient with me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for following us uh, here on The Blaze. Um, I hope you keep doing it. I hope you, you, you know, you keep engaged. I, I like the fact that we've got a lot of live listeners now uh, on the Blaze, both on um, uh, on the Blaze Radio uh, .com. We've also got a bunch of people listening live on Facebook and on uh, YouTube. So you've got many options. If for some reason sound you, you want just sound, the Blaze .com slash radio. If you want video, you can either go to YouTube or to Facebook, to my page on, on either one of those, and you can, get the, uh, you can get the live video. I don't know, the live video is not that exciting. It's just me standing in what used to be my son's bedroom and, uh, and talking to you. But, uh, all right, so we got conflicting advice on uh, YouTube. Uh, some say do yoga. Some say don't do yoga. It's really, really bad. Oh, and there was a question about artificial discs. Let me just take this, and then we'll take a break. Um, yeah, I mean, the real hope is to get an artificial disc, but I, there is no artificial disc yet that is strong enough to work in the lumbar region of the back, in the lower part of the back. And this just gives you a sense of how well designed biologically our backs are, how strong uh, the infrastructure that holds us together is biologically, uh, that there is no known... Uh, artificial disc that can be manufactured that can replace the existing uh, discs that uh, are in our backs. And all attempts have failed to do it. Now, for the neck, it works because the, the, uh, the amount of pressure, the amount of torque, the amount of uh, that the neck bears is far, far lower um, than what it is in the lumbar region. So you can get artificial discs for the neck, you still cannot really get well-functioning, proven technology, artificial discs for the lower back. Uh, one of my hopes is to delay, 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 delay the, the kind of the fusion until such an artificial disc exists. But whether that, whether that is possible in, in, in the near future is, um, is hard to tell. It's, it's an evolving technology, but it just gives you a sense of how amazing uh, the human body is in terms of uh, its uh, infrastructure. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. I want to talk about taxes. Everybody's talking about taxes. The Senate actually did something. Republicans actually passed something. It's it's a momentous event, the fact that they passed something. We'll talk about whether the something, um, how worthwhile it is. A lot of different, different things to talk about taxes. We'll get to that after... Uh, a short break. You are listening to the Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. PhD Be clear. Author, media contributor. This is the Iran Book Show, the Blaze Radio Network. listening 
to the Ron Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, so um, lots to talk about on the tax bill. A lot of different angles here. I mean, it's it, the tax bill is very illustrative of Washington, D.C., of, of, the, of the state of politics in America today. Although, you know, the state of politics in America over the last 50 years, I, I don't think it's that different than the way things have been going for the last 50 years, although the Republicans have obviously deteriorated in their approach to this, and Democrats are worse, so they're not a single Democrat voted for this. Um, so, so things are worse, but the, the principles are kind of are all the same. But what I want to do is I, I want to start somewhere differently. I want to start where really nobody out there really starts. And that's it. that is with a question of, in a sense, you know, this sounds like a bizarre question, but I, I guess you have to ask it. Why are we taxing? Why, why do we need taxes? I mean, that's stupid, right? Because we need to fund the government. Okay, but what in the government should we fund? So the real question I think we need to start with is what is the proper role of government? What should the government actually be doing? What are the appropriate proper functions of government based on our founding documents and based on morality, if you will, based on you know common sense, based on what makes sense? What is the appropriate, logical, rights-respecting role for government? And then once we can clarify what the role for government is, then we can think about, okay, what's an ideal tax structure? And then we can say, are we, is this bill moving us in that direction or isn't it moving in that direction? Is this bill rights-respecting or rights-violating? So let's start with the role of government as I see it, as Ayn Rand saw it, and I think to a large extent as the Founding Fathers saw it, although I don't think the Founding Fathers were completely 100% consistent about this. I, I, I think the Founders understood that the fundamental role of government was the protection of individual rights. Um, I, I, they weren't as explicit about that as I would like. They didn't articulate that case as strongly as I think maybe they should have. But I think it comes across both in the Declaration of Independence, where, you know, government, governments are instituted among men to do what? To protect the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what does that mean? It means that governments are instituted among men to protect our freedoms. In other words, to protect us from coercion to protect us from those who would steal from us, from those who would cheat us, from those who would murder us, from those who would invade our territory, uh, take our homes, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, commit terrorist activities against us. It's to protect our freedoms, to pursue our life, to live our lives in the pursuit of the rational values necessary for attaining our own individual success. So the fundamental role of government is articulated in the Declaration and then as elaborated on in the Bill of Rights is to protect the individual's ability to live his life free of coercion. And then we construct a government that is as small and as powerless as possible, they can still do that job. They can still do that job. I mean, gridlock is the essential characteristic of the American government. The American government is constructed in a way as so very little get done. You have two houses that in a sense can veto each other. You have a president who can veto if the both houses get together to do something. You have a president who can't do much without the consent of two houses of parliament. And then, if all three of them agree on something that is rights violating, you have a Supreme Court or, or a federal court system that can veto that. 
So you have got built into the American system of government maximum protections for the individual against government. Protect him from government getting too intrusive, too big, too rights violating, too engaged in our lives. And to try by doing that, to constrain government to doing the one job, the one role, the one function that it has, which is to protect us, to protect our ability to speak, to, 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 to act, to pursue our happiness in ways that we believe will lead to a successful life. We might be wrong, but what it's trying to protect is our ability to think and to engage in action based on our thinking. Without government intervention, without the intervention of other people, without people sticking guns in our he- to our foreheads and forcing us to act in ways we do not believe is appropriate. That is the whole point of the American government. And again, the founders created a system that tried to make it weak. Weak because government is not that important in, in any other realm of our life except this one realm, which is force. My name is Cynthia Haynes, except and I'm a senior public way. safety specialist for PG&E. My job is to help educate our first responders on how to deal with natural gas and electric emergencies. Every day when we go to work, we want everyone to work safely and come home safely. I live right here in Auburn. I absolutely love this. Sorry about that. My mistake. That was not the blaze. That was me. Um, Anyway, we created this very limited government. And we try to protect individuals as much as we could. And the sole reason to raise revenue is to produce revenue was to fund this very limited set of activities. Military. And and remember, in the original founding, there was no standing army. So it was a very limited military. Um, Police. And a judiciary. One minute. To arbitrate disputes. That was it. That was the purpose, right? That was the purpose. And yet, you know, we have come a long, long way from that government. Because imagine a government like that. A government like that would require minimal revenues. It would require very little money. Defense Department, the FBI, and the various functions to protect us from criminals at the local and state level, police force, and a judiciary system. If that's all we had to fund, it would be relatively easy to come up with a tax bill, a tax plan that made sense. But no, our government is far, far, far exceeds its initial mandate, its initial mission. It has grown beyond anything the founders could have imagined. You're on. You're on Brooke. All right, so we talked a little bit. We're talking taxes, uh, but but to frame the discussion about taxes, I thought it was important to uh, to talk about the role of government. And for me, the role of government is one: the, the protection of individual rights, the protection of our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is what. The American government was constituted for. That's what every government in the world should be constituted for. That is the only appropriate role for government, the protection of the right to life, liberty, uh, property, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, it's not what we got. Uh, What we got today is, you know, a lot more than that, right? Because... If, if that's all we had, then if you go back to, I don't know, the, the, like the 19th century, uh, then uh, federal government was max, I think, something like 3.5 to 4% in non-war years of GDP. And uh, the uh, state governments were, uh, you know, maybe another 5%. Everything was less than 10% of GDP. All government, local, federal, state 
city, the whole thing was far less than 10%. Today, we're looking at 36%. 36% of, um, you know, of, I guess, GDP is government spending. I mean, that is completely perverse and completely distorted. Um, and uh, so imagine if we could shrink spending back to those levels, which means at the federal level we shrink it by, I don't know, 70 to 80 percent. And then, you know, maybe we discussed how to raise taxes for that. Well, that would be relatively easy. In- instead of raising the kind of gazillions of dollars we raise today, we would suddenly be able to raise, a, a, you know, talk about raising some relatively minor amount or relatively small amount of taxes for function, for, for government function that we all, you know, uh, 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 that we all value, police, military, judiciary. And uh, I, I think the whole discussion around taxes would be relatively easy. Now, Ayn Rand, and I believe that ultimately... In, in a completely free society, when government is completely shrunk to its real, to its um, limited, to its appropriate size, then there's a variety of different fees, fee for use that the government can charge, for example, on contracts and other things, patents and other things like that. Um, and whatever's left would be bridged by, uh, you know, voluntary taxes or voluntary revenue. I really don't think it's an issue to raise revenue for a government that is doing it, the job that it's supposed to do. I think that's easy. The problem is, how do you raise taxes to fund a government that is out of control, that is at 40% of GDP, if, almost 40%, 36% of GDP, that at the federal level is over 20% of GDP, that is massive, and I don't know if even GDP is the right number to measure it by, but it's just it's it's trillions of dollars. How do, how does a government like that raise money? Well, the only way to do it is to confiscate, in other words, steal vast amounts of wealth from individuals like you and me, because our money, you know, there's an assumption the Democrats make, but Republicans share this. The assumption is that the money you make, it belongs to society. It's society's money. It's America's money. It's everybody else's money. And then the government decides how much you get to keep. So many politicians talk like this. They get to decide how much you get to keep. Oh, you're going to get to keep more or you're going to get to keep less. No, no. What politicians do when they decide on a particular tax scheme, is decide how much of my money and your money they are going to steal. How much of my money and your money they are going to steal. That's the fundamental decision that they're engaged in when they decide on a particular tax scheme. And... It would be nice if they talked like that. And don't, okay, so don't say steal. Don't say steal. But how much of my money they're going to take? That would be better. But the assumption is, the, the assumption is behind the entire tax debate is that the money you have is really society's money. The money you have is really belongs to the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy, the U.S. government, the society needs to spend X amount on welfare and Y amount on subsidies and Z amount on a million other different things. And then it's just a matter of how much of your money they allow you to keep because they are busy spending your money for society's well-being. See, my approach, Ayn Rand's approach to the role of government, to taxes, to government spending is an individualistic approach. Your money is yours. My money is mine. It's not societies. It's not the governments. It's not America's. You don't have a claim against my money. You don't get to take it. 
And it, then it's a question of, you know, certain functions of government have to be funded. I get that. I get that. So, you know, okay, let's fund those that are truly crucial for me to live my life as an individual. That's not where we are today. We, over the last 150, 60 years, have grown government just, just in ways that the founders would have not believed. From, you know, dozens of regulatory agencies manned by hundreds and sometimes tens of thousands of people, some of them completely unaccountable to either Congress or the president, like this Consumer Protection Bureau. Uh, others that just have massive uh, power. I don't know, the, the tens of thousands of people who work for the Department of Education. When, you know, that doesn't, uh, that's just at the federal level. It, it, what has the federal government got to do with education? Isn't most education local and at the state level? And yet they still have enough money and, and they still manage to convince themselves and everybody else that tens of thousands of people should work at the federal level in the Department of Education. And your money goes to, to, and then the, to all these regulatory agencies, massive amounts of people, massive amounts of regulations. And that does two things. One, it's a waste of your money. It's your money being used not to protect you, but to control you, to regulate you, to constrain your freedom, and to constrain the freedom of the most productive people in our society, businesses, entrepreneurs. And therefore, to limit the opportunities the rest of us have for jobs and wealth and, 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 and products and lower our standard of living dramatically. See, as a government, not only not protecting our rights, but violating our rights on a massive scale, using our own money to violate our own rights and to constrain us as individuals. It, it just boggles the mind how we just let it happen. We don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And yeah, people, people are celebrating because, because Donald Trump is, is uh, you know, reducing regulations a little bit at the margin. And that's true and that's good in some agencies, not in others, but in some agencies. And that's good. Good that he, the people he's appointed are doing a good job reducing regulation. But that's a temporary solution. That's not a long-term solution. Long-term, the laws that were passed that make these regulations necessary because it's a law have to be repealed have to be rolled back and until they're rolled back the next administration is going to come in and just impose those regulations back you've done nothing so from from before fdr from from the 1890s the antitrust laws to the regulatory agencies established to regulate railroads to the fcc which are, the ftc which was to regulate um, uh, commerce, which was established in 1914. 1914 was an awful year. Federal Reserve income tax, the FTC. I mean, just awful, awful, awful year. And of course, uh, uh, the election of maybe the, one of the worst presidents in American history, Woodrow Wilson. Um, it, it's just, the government has grown. It's just a scope that I find discussion of taxes kind of boring. Let's talk about Reducing the scope of government. Let's get back to even a semi-limited government. But what we have today is we've gone from the founding vision of a government limited to the protection of individual rights to full-blown majoritarian democracy where the government can do whatever it wants to whomever it wants almost with an unlimited power. It can violate our rights left and right we are not protected by the courts. We are not protected by the executive branch. We're not protected by uh, the fact that the legislature is split. Uh, you know, everybody wants to violate our rights, left, right, and center, and they all conspire to do it together. So, you know, we live in scary times. And we live in times where, with all due respect to Republicans and taxes, taxes are not the primary problem in the world we live in today. Now they're a problem, and we're going to get to that. The primary problem is the role and the scope of government. 
All right. I know we got a couple of callers. Um, and we will take those when we come back from this break. You're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. You're clear. So we live in a world today, unfortunately, of, of government run amok, of uh, no branch of government today having any, any, I emphasize, respect for individual rights. And I count the Supreme Court, and I count the so-called conservative Supreme Court among this. I do not believe that conservatives on the Supreme Court have a, a even a semblance of understanding of what individual rights means to the extent that the founding fathers did, or to, or to the individual rights in the context of John Locke and and the founding fathers, never mind to the understanding of an Ayn Rand of what of what individual rights mean. So there is no there is no branch of government today that protects the individual rights of American citizens. There's no branch of government today that is uh, that is guided by the idea that its job is to protect the individual rights of Americans. We're, we're all basically, uh, the entire government today is basically focused on one aspect of our Constitution, and that's the general welfare clause, the idea that it's the government's job to you know, be responsible for the general welfare. And, and, and that they have taken to mean that they have to get into every aspect of our life, decide what businesses should succeed, what businesses should fail, what businesses should be regulated, what businesses should not, what businesses should be licensed, what business should not. Uh, but even in your in, in your personal life, uh, you know, who you can marry, who you can't, uh, every aspect of our life now needs permission or, or, or intervention by a government authority, right? I mean, lemonade stands, are shut down because they don't meet regulatory approval of some regulatory government agency. And this is true at the local, at the state, and at the federal government. Our government is out of control, and, and it's, it's, it's become a true democracy. Whatever the majority wants, the majority gets. The majority wants to take more taxes from the rich. That's okay. Let's take more taxes from the rich. The, the majority wants to shut down a particular industry or to start up a particular industry. Fine, whatever the majority wants, we have become James Madison and the Founding Fathers' worst nightmare, which is a majoritarian, everything-goes government that is not constrained by anything except the will of the majority. And of course, the majority's will is always, always to, inf- to exploit the minority. And what is the smallest minority? And Earth, as Ayn Rand observed but it's kind of obvious when you think about it. A lot of what Ayn Rand says is kind of obvious when you think about it. Unfortunately, very few people think about it. Uh, and that is the, the, the individual. The individual is the smallest minority on earth. So the majority is always going to try to exploit, take advantage of the minority, which is the individual. And that's exactly what we're seeing everywhere, all the time. Republicans, Democrats, Obama, Trump, doesn't matter. It does not matter. Local governments, state governments, federal government, doesn't matter. We have lost, and this is, I think, should be a real cause for pessimism. We have lost the vision of the founding. We have lost the vision of our founding documents. And we don't have politicians who who talk about it even. I mean, it's rare. It is rare that uh, politicians talk about kind of what this country really stands for. Talk about really individual rights. Talk about limited government. Who talks about limited government? I mean, Democrats don't want limited government, neither do Republicans. They all want unlimited governments in those scopes that they want to control our lives in. And even if some Republicans talk about it, talk is cheap. They don't do anything about it. They don't actually go out there. They don't actually go out there and, and, and roll back, roll back um, the government. So I think the American public cares, but it cares in some vague emotional sense. Ooh, don't tread on me, but keep your hands off of my Medicare. 
we'll do a whole show on Medicare, but Medicare is just one more welfare program. It's not your Medicare. It's your kids' money that is going to be spent on your Medicare and your grandkids or other people's grandkids' money. So the understanding of individual rights and their willingness to actually defend individual rights, the American public just doesn't have that. They, they don't have the understanding. And, and I don't blame them because nobody teaches it. Our intellectuals are impotent when it comes to it. So all of this is to say that to talk about taxes in the vacuum of talking about spending is absurd. If I were president, and if I were, or if I were in, you know, Republican Senate or whatever, my entire focus, my entire focus, all of my energy would be dedicated to cutting spending and cutting regulations. And then, once I achieved something there, to cutting taxes and making taxes make more sense. Now, people are saying, People are saying, uh, I know free market types and, and uh, uh, Ayn Rand fans and are saying, oh, this is great. This is the biggest tax cut in history. What difference does that make if you don't cut spending? So, yes, you're not taking money from me in one channel, which is through taxes. You're taking it from another channel, which is by borrowing it. And how do you pay back borrowed money? So if you don't cut spending and you cut taxes by a trillion and a half, which is what they're doing, then they, they have to make up the difference. And they make up the difference by borrowing. Now, people say, oh, the economy will grow to make up. Maybe, maybe to grow, but how much? And, and as long as they don't cut spending, there's still going to be a gap. So they have to borrow. And when they borrow, how do you pay back borrowing? Only two ways to pay back borrowing. You either print money or you tax future generations. And government does both. And printing money creates basically forms of inflation. It raises our uh, cost of living. It reduces our standard of living in complex, varied ways, but it does. And raising taxes on future generations, how's that right? So even if it's true that taxes are being cut, that I right now will pay fewer taxes. It makes no difference in the big scheme of things because one, my, I'm not freer. I'm still being regulated and controlled and government is everywhere, wherever I go. I'm, the government is still sucking money out of the private economy by borrowing. So economically, it's not clear that it makes any sense because money is still leaving the private economy where it could be used effectively to create economic growth. And being shuffled into a public economy, a public economy is a contradiction in terms, into a government bureaucracy where it is wasted, thrown away, and not used for productive causes. So economic growth is hampered. I'm still being regulated, controlled, and everything else. And long term, the consequences are awful because I'm still going to have to raise taxes down the road, which happens every time. After a major tax cut by a Republican, think Reagan, and then Bush raises taxes, and then uh, uh, Clinton raises them again. Think Bush Jr. cuts taxes, Obama raises them. Trump is now going to cut taxes. The next president, Republican or Democrat, will raise them. One and minute. It's, it's long-term has very little meaning, very little value if what you care about is freedom. What really matters is the scope and scale of government. And that means what really matters is government spending and government regulation. And that, the Republican House and Senate have done nothing to alleviate. They've done nothing to cut back long term. Whatever's being done at the regulatory agencies is great short term. 30. Long term does nothing for us. So... I'm not excited about the tax cut. Now, when we come back, we've got, a, we've got a hard break here. When we come back, we'll talk about more details about the taxes, what is good, what is bad about them specifically, but not excited. You're listening to your own book show. Ten. We're here on the Blaze Radio Network, and, and we're going to be back after uh, the news and after this uh, 
Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. All right, we're back, and we're talking uh, role of government and taxes. And uh, just to fill those of you who are joining us in the second hour, a little low energy today, recovering from back surgery I had on Tuesday. I, no medications, so I'm not I'm not hallucinating or anything. So don't worry about that. I've been off medication since really the day of surgery. Haven't taken any any painkillers or anything like that. That's a good sign. But a little low energy, so I apologize for that. Um, all right, so we're we're talking um, uh, taxes here, and you know, it, it really is it really is uh, incredibly frustrating to see uh, this bill that does nothing to curb the role of government, to curb the scope of government, to, to reduce um, government intervention in the economy or government intervention in our lives. And it, such a bi- the, the Republicans are making such a big deal out of uh, this legislation as if it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really crucially important somehow to our lives when it's, it's not that big of a deal. As I said, because they're not cutting spending, the taxes you might be saving uh, this year, you'll have to make up in years in the future. One way or another, you are going to have to pay the debt. You're going to have to pay up for all the spending government has engaged in and is going to engage in over the 10 years. There is no, there is no alternative to massive government spending. So if I were president, I would... Uh, have a bill in front of Congress at the very least to cut spending by 5 to 10% every year for the next eight years of my presidency. I would start by cutting all subsidies and all goodies to businesses and at the same time it, it reducing and eliminating whole swaths of regulation. But yeah, Republicans can't do that. <laughs> that would be asking too much of those who claim to defend the vision of the founders. Yeah, right. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, it, it's just this is pathetic. And, and those of you who think Donald Trump is a second coming, this is pathetic. This is pathetic. This is pathetic. How many times do I have to say it? Um, okay, we're going to take a call from uh, Doug. And, and uh, Skyler, we're going to take your call in the last segment of the show the moment of reason, that's the segment that we take callers uh, to talk about anything. Uh, we're at 888-900-3393 if you want in on the conversation. 888-900-3393 if you want to discuss taxes, the role of government, uh, or anything else in the last segment of the show. Just just dial in. You know, we're waiting for you. All right, uh, let's see. We've got Doug. Hey, Doug, how's it going? It's going great, uh, except that uh, I'm a little bummed out about your back problems. I didn't really know those. But anyhow, uh, I love Well, your believe show. me, I'm more bummed out about ideas, them than you are. Of course, like objectivism <laughs> rules. However, um, every once in a while when you talk about courts, um, you, you seem to lump the federal court system with the Supreme Court. And I've always understood from constitutional guys – that Congress created that and can change rules there. What, what's your take on that? I mean, I'm not an expert on this topic, and, I, and so I, I, I don't know. Congress certainly can, but all rules ultimately can be challenged through the Supreme Court, and, and uh, the Supreme Court's job, as I understand it, is I, and I think this was perverted later on, but I think as originally intended, the Supreme Court's job was to assess whether a particular law, a particular rule, um, was constitutional or not, whether it violated the Constitution or didn't violate the Constitution. So it was the job of the Supreme Court to assess the constitutionality of the laws passed by Congress and the decisions come to by the federal courts. So it was the final arbitrator of uh, whether a law or whether a rule or whether a particular government behavior were constitutional or not. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Agreed. It's just with all the shenanigans and all of the little um, 
I want to say turds that have been placed in the swimming pool by Obama with these federal court. It would be really cool, although I can't imagine this with the current crop of Republicans. I can't imagine that they would actually say, hey, you're not going to rule on X, Y, you know, Z. And that certainly would cut down a lot of the nonsense that's been going but on. But I don't think they can do that. They certainly can't do that to the Supreme Court, and there has to be a mechanism to bring a case well, to the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. I think it would be unconstitutional for Republicans to say we're passing laws and these laws are above the judiciary. The judiciary has no, um, cannot make an argument with regard to them. That would be, that would be exact violation of, of the principles that the founders articulated. The whole point, again, I, I return to a point I made earlier. The whole point of our Constitution is to make passing laws hard, to make changing laws hard hard to, to 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 make it difficult to to present as many barriers as possible before government growing by imposing new laws so if you're going to pass a law it better be good that is you better be able to p- convince the house convince the senate pass judicial muster and any challenges to the supreme court and of course the president has to sign it all these things have to go into it before a law can pass. And, and that's why the whole idea is to have very few laws. It's not to have laws that engage in every aspect of our lives. It's to be very judicial. Is that the right word? Anyway, very careful in what laws you pass because the laws can only be about the protection of individual rights and nothing else. And that's hard. So no, I, I don't believe in giving Congress more power than it has. It has way too much power now. So if, if the courts block Congress, good, good. Uh, you know, sometimes that'll hurt my cause because the courts will be too leftist. Sometimes it'll hurt the leftist cause because the courts will happen to be conservative because it'll be a post-conservative, uh, you know. But, you know, that's the price we pay. And I don't believe we can make significant progress in any of these things without a conception of limited government and without a discussion about limited government and without a projection of a limited government ideal to which we are moving towards. And and that's my job as I see it. I'm here to articulate the case of a idealistic view of, of government, an idealistic view that I believe is possible and that we need to move towards. And, and in that context, I am arguing today that the tax bill is not that important, that it's not that big of a deal, that the real deal is cutting spending and reducing the scope of government and reducing what government does. Right. And I, you know, somebody, somebody mentions the audit the Fed. It's not about auditing the Fed. What are you d- d- going to discover when you audit the Fed that you don't already know? That it is a crony-filled, manipulative organization that has no clue what it's doing and is it a d- destructive force in the U.S. economy and is engaged in immoral activities of redistributing wealth in bizarre ways? I know that already. I don't need to audit the Fed to do that. What you need is to get rid of the Fed. What we need is the new to the Fed. That's what we need. And for that, you need a principle. You need a principle vision of the role of government. It's not the role of government to, to be engaged in currency manipulation. It's not the role of government to set interest rates. It's not the role of government to, you know, determine our money. Right? Yep. All right. So thanks, Doug. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. So what we need is, is politicians who are willing, to some extent or another, to be idealists. The left has this. The left has always had that. They've always had the, the socialists out there who say, no, this is what we want. We want socialized medicine. What the right, the, the so-called right, what the Republicans don't have is this person who stands up and says, no, what I want is 100% Privatized medicine, which means no Medicare, no Medicaid, no government involvement in healthcare at all. My name is Valerie Decker, and I'm a troubleman for PG&E. Here we I go am a first again. responder. Uh, my computer goes nuts every time, and it starts a commercial by itself. All right. 
Um, so that's my job since Republicans won't do it, since our politicians don't do it, since 99.999% of talk show radio hosts won't do it. I will do it. All right. And indeed, you're listening to your Ron Book Show. We're on the Blaze Radio Network. Uh, you can listen on theblaze.com slash radio every Saturday from 12 to 2 East Coast time. And we'll be back right after this break. This is the Yaron Brooks Show. All right, we're talking taxes, and I know I've got a couple of callers. I've got Alex on the line and Skyla, and uh, uh, there are a few points I want to make about taxes, and I want to make sure I get to them because I think they're, I think they're just kind of observations that I think are interesting. Let's start by the coverage the tax bill has received from the mainstream media. I mean, it really is amusing, horrifying, depressing, funny. It's just so biased. It's just so nakedly biased. Now, I'm not for this tax bill. I don't think it's a good tax bill for reasons I'll get to in a little while and reasons I've already articulated. It doesn't matter because unless you cut spending. But to call it a tax scam and suddenly for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post to be concerned about the deficit. These people are never concerned about the deficit when you're talking about increasing spending. No, then the deficit is stimulative. Then they bring up... They, 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 they uh, bring up Krugman and, and Keynes, although Keynes would be horrified by their views on economics. You know, then suddenly deficit spending is good. If it's spending, then deficit is good. Increasing the deficit through lowering taxes, that is horrible. Now, I think it's horrible for both reasons, right? But it's just, it's just funny, right? And then the other one that I thought was hysterical was, oh, my God. It's a 500-page bill. Nobody's had a chance to read it, and they're voting on it. Do you remember who made that accusation against whom? That was was the Republicans against the Democrats about Obamacare. Nobody knows what in it. Do you remember Pelosi said, um, you're going to have to find out what's in the bill after we pass it? Well, that's exactly the same thing is happening with this... this, um, tax bill and I think it happens with many bills but now suddenly the media cares and of course the Republicans don't care now because it's their bill so the fact that the people voting on it have no clue what's in it they don't care about that Uh, they cared when it was a Democrats bill and but the media cares because suddenly they've discovered that congressmen should actually read the bills before they vote on them maybe that's a good thing because it's a Republican bill but when Obamacare was passed, the, the media was completely silent on that part. So it just it just exposes the, the, the outrageous biases that the media has. You know, uh, Fox is celebrating, CNN is depressed, the New York Times come out, comes out with these editorials that are just like the end of the world is with us. Then they, they, the way they, they use statistics, they tell us, oh, most of the tax cuts are for the rich. I wish, let me just be clear, I wish most of the taxes for the rich because, uh, one, I would get more of the tax benefit if that were the case, and two, um, it, it would be a better for the economy. So actually economic growth would be spurred more than the pathetic tax cuts for the rich that are being passed here. Uh, but what they use is the dollar amount. So the rich, they're going to save $1,000 on their taxes. Whippy! The poor are only going to save $50 in their taxes. That's because the poor person who's saving $50 in his taxes only pays 60 and the rich pay millions of dollars in taxes, and they're saving 1000 or whatever. I'm, I'm making up numbers, right? So what? You don't use a dollar amount. You use a percentage. So the way they use statistics, of course, we all know this, is to bolster their case. And Fox is just as guilty as the others. Fox has is, is, is perpetuated this stupidity. I, I saw a story on Fox where they're using dollar figures. It's just stupid. Of course, the rich are going to get more of the dollars. They pay something like 40% of all the income taxes. So they're going to get a bigger cut if you're going to cut their taxes at all. By definition, d- 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 
multiply any number by a big number, a small percentage by a big number, you're going to get a bigger dollar amount than the pathetic amount, the small amount of taxes that relatively poor people pay. Now, again, I think everybody's paying too much. Everybody's paying too much, except those who, anyway, everybody's paying too much. Right, so the coverage I find is, is quite entertaining, horrific, and, and reflective of just the, the lunacy which is our media today. The bias, the, the, the complete and utter shamelessness. How partisan they absolutely, with no exception, are, uh, you know, have. Left and right. And, and it's so reflected here. I mean, the left is just going apoplectic today about this tax, this tax cut. Why do they care? That's the other funny thing is why does the left care? The left shouldn't care. None of their programs are being harmed. None of the spending that they so desire is going away. So what do they care? They shouldn't, right? The only reason they care is because they... Uh, I, well, actually, let me f correct that. I don't think they do care. I think this is all just a scam. I think this is all just them putting up pretenses. They care only to the extent that they hate successful, wealthy people and they'd like to see their taxes go up. It has nothing to do with economics. I don't think a single person on the left you know, cares because what they really care about is, is the other programs, is the spending side. And they care about taxes as penalizing success. So that's the level that they care about. They don't care about the middle class. They certainly don't care about the poor. They have no concept of, of, of the poor and or, or what it would take to improve the lives of the poor. They have no interest, zero interest in improving the lives of poor people. Aye. So, okay, so that's one aspect of the taxes that I thought was, uh, was worth mentioning. Just the coverage, if you read the stories, they, they're completely completely nonsensical you you it's it's hard to find any actual data all right let's talk a little bit about um well let's let me talk about one other aspect the conservatives mentioned and, and some free market people mentioned they don't mind that the deficit's going to go up because following i think milton friedman first came up with this idea it's the idea of starving the government from funds the idea is the bigger the deficit, the more government is going to be forced to um, reduce spending. And the idea here is um, the bigger the deficit, the higher interest rates are going to be. The bond market is going to raise interest rates in ways that are not sustainable for the U.S. government. It's going to hurt the economy. And any president, any president is going to have to try to reduce those interest rates by um, shrinking the deficit. And, and this was a very, very popular argument during the 90s. And indeed, there's some case to be made that it actually worked in the 90s, that, that, the, that the bond market actually placed, pre placed pressure on the Democrats and, and Republicans, Republican House and Senate, uh, Republican House, Democratic Senate, and, and Bill Clinton as president, to actually reduce the growth of government. And, and if you look at Clinton, Clinton's one of the best presidents in a long, long time in terms of reducing the, the growth of government spending. Better than Bush, better than Obama, and probably better than Trump in terms of reducing the growth of government spending. And the government actually achieved um, balance at the end of the Clinton uh, administration. Another reason for that was the dot-com bubble and all the taxes they raised through capital gains taxes when all those dot-com dot com companies went public. But it was also partially because they really did reduce the rate of growth of government, the rate of growth of government spending uh, to Bill Clinton's credit, one of the only things that I would give uh, that administration and that, that period of time any credit for. Um, well, I mean, Clinton gets a lot of credit for not doing any, not doing very much. I mean, that's the main credit he gets for spending too much time uh, having to deal with sex scandals and sex itself, I guess, and very little time uh, actually governing, and that, that worked out well. Um, okay, so, but the fact is that over the long term, this deficit argument doesn't work. It seems like the bond market is willing to tolerate very high levels of debt, particularly 
when you have a Federal Reserve that manipulates those interest rates, buys government debt uh, at lower and lower interest rates, and, uh, and, and thus makes it possible for the government to grow, grow, grow with no negative consequences. So um, I don't think that Milton Friedman argument actually works, unfortunately, which it did. So I don't think deficits actually strangle government. I just think they ignore them, and that's, that's been the history. They've just ignored the deficits, and they've grown. And, and the, the total debt of the United States government on the books is $20 trillion. It's still true that our unfunded liabilities are somewhere between 60 to $200 trillion. Mind-boggling numbers, and nobody, 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 nobody in politics seems to care. So, um, you know, that's another tidbit about taxes. The, uh, a, a few other things. Um, let me just say something about corporate taxes. Corporate taxes are sales and employment tax. Uh, shareholders pay very little of corporate taxes. If you look at every economic study, and I've mentioned this in the past shows, the tax is paid by consumers with, through higher prices and by employees with lower wages. So the only corporate tax that makes any sense, if you don't like hidden taxes, is a corporate tax of zero. Corporations are legal, uh, legal nexus of contracts. They're not a person. Two minutes. They don't pay anything, really. It's we as individuals pay as shareholders, as consumers, and as, um, as employees. So the only tax rate that makes sense for a corporation is zero. So I am, I am happy anytime you reduce corporate taxes. And I wish they'd reduce them more. So in my view, they didn't reduce them enough. So it, it, it'll, it'll serve to reduce prices. It'll serve to, uh, to uh, increase wages. It'll serve to spur economic growth. It, you know, it's a no-lose proposition to lower corporate taxes. It eliminates a, uh, a hidden tax. And I think hidden taxes are particularly immoral because people don't understand how they work. And, they, they, you know, money is being stolen from them and they don't even know it. At least one minute. Income tax is explicit. You know how much is being taken. You get a paycheck. You see how much is gone. You know it. It's still immoral. It's still wrong. It's still evil. But you get to see it, right? Hidden taxes are much, much worse because you don't even get to see it. And most people are too economically ignorant to know that it's happening. But the way they cut corporate taxes is, again, flawed. They should have just made it simple again. But they've Dirty. left a thousand different loopholes and exclusions and subsidies and benefits to particular industries that particular senators liked or didn't like or hated okay. or whatever. And this is the point we'll really get to next time and how this tax bill is filled with, with cronyism. Ten. is filled with trying to manipulate our lives. All right, you're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. The Yaron Brooks Show. Hey, we're back. Um, I wanted to make a point, which I should have made earlier, when I talked about the 500-page, uh, you know, legislation. And uh, because somebody made it on, on Facebook, and they're absolutely right, and I should have said it. I, I think we should have, it, it, it should be a constitutional amendment, I think, that no legislation is passed that is longer than X number of pages, I don't know, five maybe 15, that is not written in plain English that any American can understand it, and that certainly that congressmen can understand it if they're going to vote on it. So it has to be written in a language that the simplest-minded, I don't know, somebody like Roy Moore, let's say, simplest-minded politician out there can actually understand the language, what it actually means. I mean, the fact that this tax bill is passing with super complexity. You know, taxes are raised after five years and decline over here and there are limits over there and there's some constraints over there and nobody knows what's in it. Nobody. Nobody, nobody, nobody knows exactly what's in it. The fact that a bill like that could be passed is absolutely absurd and ridiculous and immoral 
and and it, 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 the same with Obamacare and with a million other Dodd Frank, all these regular all these laws, laws should be simple, and if you're expected to abide by it, you should be able to understand it. Life is not that complicated, so that you can understand it. And a tax bill in particular should be such that you know. Everybody knows exactly what they're, what, what they're going to be paying. That you don't need a high-priced tax accountant in order to figure out the taxes. And that's what I need. I need a high-priced tax accountant in order to figure out my taxes, which is absurd. I am big on uh, postcard. Everybody should pay their taxes on a postcard. Corporate taxes should be zero. So zero corporate taxes, the beauty of that is no deductions, no exclusions, no loopholes because they're not paying any taxes only individuals pay taxes everybody should pay ta some tax as long as we've got this big government we have to fund it somehow everybody should pay it it should be simple 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 no deductions no exclusions nothing you make x you pay x that's it it would be nice if it was something like 10 percent on all revenue that you get you pay out no mortgage deductions no Child care deductions, no health care deductions, nothing. No deductions, zero. Not at the corporate level because corporations don't pay any taxes and not at the individual level. And that would be simple, easy. Um, everybody could get it. Wages would go sky high. Prices would drop. Productivity would increase dramatically. The U.S. economy would grow significantly. The real standard of living and quality of life of Americans would accelerate dramatically. It's a simple, simple stuff. They would stop trying to manipulate my behavior. That's the other thing that drives me nuts, right? Oh, no, you have to have a mortgage. Why? Why do I have a mortgage? Why can't I rent? Oh, no, you have to give to charity. Why? Why isn't it better for me to invest for my retirement? Oh, no, you need to invest in your retirement. Why do I need to invest in my retirement but not invest for a car that I really need so I can build a business so that I, then I can invest for my retirement? Why are they trying to tell me how to use my money? Not only are they stealing my money, that's step one, but then they use the tax code to socially engineer me. I resent that. All exclusions, all deductions should be eliminated zeroed out completely. I think that's more important than whether you have graduated taxes or not. You know, different tax rates or not. Much more important is zero deductions, zero exclusions, flat, and then lower everybody's taxes dramatically. Then it, it, it makes sense. Then it makes sense. I, I, any other tax reform... You know, so I was reading this story about how they got this to pass, right? And they basically got this to pass by twisting different congressmen's hands and giving a favor to this one and something else to that one and a little bit to this one and a little bit to that one, which makes the bill more and more and more and more complex. And they did this for months leading up to the bill, and then they did even more of it in the days as they were negotiating the final passage. How can that be a good bill? How can anything good come out of the cronyism, the, the favor giving, the, the, the pressure group politics of these kind of last minute deals? Oh, my constituency wants this and my constituency wants that and we want a mortgage deduction and they want this deduction and somebody else wants some of the other deduction. It's all disgusting. And again, the founding fathers would be horrified. Now, of course, the tax bill hasn't really passed. What now needs to happen is we've got a, a, a House bill and a Senate bill. And now the host trading continues because now they're going to host trade around all the things that are different between the House and the Senate bill and round off all sharp edges and make sure that everybody's in line. And of course, uh, Trump has said he'll sign anything. Just send him anything, he'll sign it. Because he needs something to say he did something. Because so far, he, he has done very little on the legislative front. Arguably done very little anywhere, but certainly on the legislative front. And some things on the, on the regulatory front with regulatory agencies. But, but, but nothing permanent in terms of, or semi-permanent in terms of legislation. So he needs something there. Um, 
So it's going to be interesting to see what the final, final bill, and we'll talk again about taxes when the final, final bill, and, and by then maybe we'll understand actually what's in it um, and, and be able to dissect it and give you my opinions. But right now, there's, there's many, many issues in which they have to reconcile the House and the Senate bill, and how they go on some of these will determine whether the bill becomes more complex or less complex. My guess is more complex, more complex rather than less complex. And again, any bill that's 500 pages, any bill that's complex, any bill that needs lawyers and accountants to, 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 to understand is not a bill that is worth uh, voting for. Uh, it, it's more disasters. And, and again, not the issue. The issue is spending. The issue is the, via, the, the fact that the government is violating, um, violating the talk, uh, our, uh, our rights. Now, I know... Some people are calling in and getting a busy signal. I have no control over that. You shouldn't be getting a busy signal. So if you want, we're, we're heading towards the kind of the Ask Me Anything segment, 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. And we've got Alex and Skyla. We're going to take a quick break now, and we're going to go to Alex and then to Skyla and then to anybody else who calls and manages to get through. And if nobody gets through, then I've got a ton to talk about. So... Uh, uh, no, no shortage of topics today. All right, we're going to take this break. You're listening to your Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Yes. You're on Brook. Hi, right, we're back, and we got the final 13 minutes or so of the show uh, before us. I'm going to take callers. Uh, Anybody who wants to ask a question about anything, we call this a moment of reason where I just take questions and we're going to go to Alex and Skyler in one minute. I'll also take this opportunity to encourage you, um, if you enjoy the show, if you uh, believe in the show, if you want to show the sh see the show grow, to support the show. You can support it in many ways. You can subscribe. If you're watching it right now on YouTube, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can like me on Facebook um, and you can share, 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 share. At the end of the day, what makes shows and episodes and videos and audio clips grow is sharing. Uh, likes don't matter that much. Nothing else matters to the algorithms of Google and Facebook and Twitter and everybody else. Nothing matters like sharing. So please share the show uh, to, to your friends, to, to, to people. Just random people should be listening to the show. So just share it. Who knows where it goes out there given the algorithms. And if you're, if, if you're so inclined and if you want to see the show uh, promoted more professionally and, and grow more substantially, then you can help financially by going to patreon.com to your own Brooks show and, uh, and providing financial support. Anything from $2 a month uh, to $5,000 a month, you get different perks depending on uh, how much you contribute. But I certainly appreciate that support. We've raised a good amount of money so far. But the sheer number of people supporting the show is still relatively small. So I'd love to see, I'd love to see more of you financially supporting the show, even if it's just at two dollars a month, because that that gives me a sense of the growing community, uh, the number of people who are willing to put their money where their mouth is, or where their heart is, or where their mind is. Even better. All right, um, Alex, you want to talk about the national debt? Alex, um, you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, speak up. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, I have I have kind of three questions about the national oh debt. Oh my god! Um, I kind right. of lack basic understanding on it. So, uh, who owes the money? Who do we owe it to? And I've heard people say, you know, we have the strongest army in the world. Why don't we just say, uh, you know, we're not paying you back? Sorry about your luck. All right. Good questions. Okay. Who owes it? Well, the government owes it. So uh, the U.S. government owes it. Um, just like the government uh, owes you Social Security when you're, when you're older, or owes you Medicare, or, or makes promises uh, to people. Now, the government has no resources, so the government at the end of the day can only pay it by taking it from us, from, from taxpayers. So at the end of the day, if you will, we the people owe it, our representatives have hawked, have placed us in debt. And, um, and so we, the people, owe it, and we are going to have to pay for it. And the only two ways to pay for it, as 
I've um, described earlier. One is uh, to print money which basically raises prices or creates bubbles, but creates massive economic distortions and is basically a tax to us. Or uh, the, it, we can tax it, which means taxes have to go up in the future dramatically in order to, for the children and the grandchildren to pay for the debts taken on by the parents and grandparents. And in the meantime, even in the meantime, the national debt is a cause for slower economic growth because it is a way to suck money out of the private economy and into the public economy and, and reduces productivity and, and everything else. So it's a bad, bad thing that we, our representatives committed that we will pay, we the ta being the taxpayers. Who do we owe it to? Well, I don't have the most recent numbers, but who holds government debt? Well, our banks do, American banks and international banks do, um, insurance companies, pension plans. I'd say if you have a 401k, it's likely that a certain portion of that 401k is in a bond fund, which holds government bonds, which is then owed to you. Uh, so it's owed to a lot of Americans, but it's also owed to a lot of foreigners. It's owed to, you know, a big chunk of it is owed to the Japanese and the British and uh, the Netherlands, for whatever reason, has a big chunk of American debt. Um, the Japanese, a massive amount of American debt. So uh, any country that has dollars, which means any country that actually exports goods to us, uh, that has a trade deficit, uh, a trade surplus with us, has dollars and uses those dollars to typically buy government bonds because they're relatively safe. So China, of course, has been a large purchaser of government debt over the years. But let's not delude ourselves. A vast amount, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's easy to look up, of that debt is owed to us, to, uh, to pension plans, insurance companies, and, and your own savings. Um, we all probably have some of our saving, whether we know it or not, in, um, in um, government bonds. Now, beyond that, that's just the explicit debt on the books of the government. There's also the unfunded liability. So this is all the promises we've made to Social Security and Medicare. This is the real big number, 60 to $100 billion. That is owed to people who are going to be old. It's owed to the baby boom generation. It's owed to the people just after that. That's money that's owed to them. Where that money will come from, either by borrowing, who knows who will borrow from, who will lend us money at that point, or again, by raising taxes. So uh, the amount of money that the government has promised on our behalf to give to us and to many other people around the world is mind-boggling. But it's all debt that we are supposed to pay. Now, one alternative is not to pay it. What are they going to do? Well, that is an alternative, absolutely. But that will probably mean not paying anybody. So what about the Social Security? What about Medicare? And that means nobody's ever going to lend us money in the future. Or it's going to be very difficult to borrow money in the future. And that means the government's going to have to be balanced in the future. That'll be quite an achievement if we could do that. So certainly we could default on the debt. Uh, I mean, uh, um, Greece defaulted on some of its debt, not on all of it, but some of it. Other countries, I mean, Venezuela is defaulting on some of its debt right now. Uh, countries have defaulted on their debt. It's, it's quite possible. But there are real consequences to that uh, in, in terms of whether people will lend you money again. And it also means that your own citizens are going to be uh, hurt by the default. And it means that how are you going to fund Social Security and Medicare in the future if you can't borrow? So you can do it. And arguably, that's what should be done. I don't think I, we should penalize China more than we should penalize Americans. Uh, and it's more than that. Um, the, if the Chinese don't buy our debt, they're less likely to export to us. That means our standard of living will actually decline. Our standard of living is, is higher than it otherwise would be because we import so many goods from China. I mean, the whole, the whole discussion of trade is upside down. Uh, 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 Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have managed to completely, completely turn the discussion of trade upside down from the truth. Both of them are complete and utter ignoramuses when it comes to trade. Um, 
anyway, so did I answer your questions? I think I answered all three. Uh, yeah, you, you definitely answered all three. Okay, um, good. I really appreciate it. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thanks, Alex. All right, we're going to go to Skyla. Hey, Skyla, how's it going? Hey, greetings. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Not quite yet. Not quite yet. We're getting there. Not quite there. yet, but, you know, just for the greeting. Season's greeting. Sure. Merry Christmas. Why not? I love Christmas. <laughs> I'll, I'll a do question. a Christmas show um, when the time comes. Absolutely. Robert Fulgham had a book called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Yep. And I know the battleground for the mind is at the university level, but shouldn't we be able to focus our attention on the youngest and the children to teach them that instead of shit of, of, of giving we should trade of being selfish and to be life-loving individuals in the yeah, future. No, absolutely we should do that i mean i wish there were more children's books that uh that discussed these kind of issues that presented these kind of issues i think there's a whole industry that could be created of good children's books that actually taught good positive values that actually uh that actually were pro uh reason rational egoism and liberty uh, so children's books would be one way. I think, uh, I think establishing schools. We, we've got at least uh, three schools that I'm aware of that at least in, its found, in their foundings were intended to educate according to these principles. Uh, all three are actually based in Orange County, California, funnily enough. So they, they, are, they are primary schools. They are homeschoolers trying to do this. So yeah, I think we need to uh, dominate the primary and elementary school education so that we can teach kids how to think. Uh, you, you're not going to succeed in changing the world unless the people around you can think because ours is an intellectual revolution. It's a philosophical revolution. It's, it's to change the way people think about the most fundamental ideas in life. And unless we can convince people to do that, we will not be successful. But to do that, people have to be thinkers. They have to be critical thinkers. They have to know how, the methodology of thinking. They have to be conscious thinkers. They have to be engaged in thinking and, and see its value. And I think that those kind of habits of thinking uh, need to be inculcated, um, inculcated in our young uh, as early as possible. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes, sir, it did. Thank Good. you for that. I appreciate cool. it. Cool. I mean, uh, people were, you know, Robert wants to say, if we default in that debt, China will start shipping soldiers in boxes disguised as Amazons. No, I mean, what will happen is China will tell us to go to hell and, and China will stop exporting us because they won't want our dollars. The dollar will collapse. The dollar will disappear as a global currency. Uh, if, we, if, if, if we stop funding the debt, uh, we will not be able to buy anything from China because China will not want our dollars. And the standard of living in the United States will collapse. I mean, this idea that trade is good for China and bad to the U.S. is exact opposite. It, it, well, not opposite. It's good for China and the U.S. Trade is win-win. Um, and uh, the idea that, that uh, China investing in our bonds is bad for America is, is again, ludicrous. It's, it's all a, a misconception of what trade is. And fundamentally, trade is between individuals, not between countries. Fundamentally, it's me going to Walmart, buying something made in China, which benefits me because I got something cheaper and better. It benefits Walmart because they made a profit. It benefits the Chinese company that sold it to Walmart. And it benefits the Chinese employees who, who made it for the One Chinese minute. company who sold it to Walmart. Along the entire supply chain, all you get is win-win relationships. Everybody wins. And then on top of that, when the Chinese person gets those dollars and puts them into Chinese bank, those dollars have to find their way back into America in a form of investment. And that's exactly what happens. They're invested in American assets. In America, because we take dollars. We don't take yuans. So they're Maybe. investing in government bonds or in real estate or in the Chinese buying American factories or whatever. But that's the beauty, the win, 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 win. 20. Relationship, which is global trade. Globalization, when it comes to trade, is the best thing that's happened to the world in the last 40 years. 10. All right. You're listening to your Unbook Show. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, on the Blaze Radio Network. You're clear.
All right, I got past to the Yaron Brook show. You made it. I made it. I'll talk to you next week. Yep.